want me to because it's your book that you've chosen Ooh, so I, do you want me to yes. not, not kick things off not kick things no, off but no, do you want I, me to do i want, so you, to in, we, I want you to introduce it a hundred percent okay so what are we talking about today for you no no you're gonna do the whole spiel at the beginning sam no 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 i wasn't <laughs> gonna do that Oh, rubbish. All right, well, I'll do the whole spiel. Sh- he'll do the whole spiel at the beginning, but you can definitely ask the questions. How's that? I can give it a go if you want, but I'm not going to be... I would appreciate it. But... <laughs> <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the DM's Book Club, a podcast where we read about some Dungeons and & Dragons and discuss how we might include it in our role-playing games. Uh, I am not the host. The host is... Oh, Sam. F- the great, the fabulous Fiona Howard. Oh, Samuel, Samuel. You was, oh, honestly, we, before we started recording, Sam was like, should I do something? I'm like, yes, introduce. And then Sam was like, oh no, panic, 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 panic. <laughs> that was a great introduction, Sam. Thank you. I read it from your script. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> Sam is again joining me for another bonus episode. So we am delighted to have you back. It's so much. I've really enjoyed Obelix's. So we thought, why not give us another go? But instead of going for three pages, we'll go for a lot more pages. Yeah, yeah something like 20, 20 pages. It was quite a lot of pages, well, I will admit. Politics <laughs> and describing worlds and, oh, but it's, it's good. What is the book that we're talking about this week, Fiona? Thank you very much, Sam. <laughs> you got this hosting down, man. It's all good. So I got to choose the topic this week. Obviously, Sam, very kindly on the last bonus episode, chose Oblexes. So I thought one thing I really struggle with is, well, not even struggle with, but something I, I love doing is coming up with towns or having something like a, a starting point or a, a place where the heroes can return to time and time again. But it is something that you can change depending on the setting. And I wanted to look at something that was pre-written, but look at how all the different factors would affect a settlement. So I picked the first chapter of uh, Ghost of Salt Marsh, which is just essentially Salt Marsh. I think that's what I think that's what it's called. Isn't it? uh, yeah, chapter one, Salt Marsh. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I mean, it says on the tin. It's so simple. So yeah, chapter one of Salt Marsh in the Ghost of Salt Marsh. <laughs> down this this first chapter what what kind of aspects does it go through about this town so i think what's interesting about this chapter and it's compared to other materials i've read which has always started with the adventure or having like you come to this town and then you have two or three pages detailing the town at least from the modules that i've run i'm sure uh i'm sure you'll probably correct me if i'm wrong but i'm sure like uh Dragon Heist has a lot more about uh, Waterdeep, and all the other books usually have something about Waterdeep and then connect with the modules, uh, all the adventures in them. This chapter starts really differently. I've never sort of seen this before, and I'm, again, this might just be me, but it starts off with sort of the themes and the sort of the, so the main factions that influence this whole town's uh, sort of prospects and so the underlying tensions of it. So Saltmarsh is essentially a uh, it's self-described as sort of a nondescript, which is always a great word to, <laughs> to describe your towns, isn't it? A nondescript fishing village tucked away on the southern coast of the kingdom of Keoland. So it, instantly you get these images of, you know, for me, um, so I used to, uh, when I was younger, go on holidays to Scotland and there's sort of the fishing villages around East Nuke. So you have like Pitt and Ween, Crail, Anstruther. They've all got these very picturesque houses, but they rely heavily on the fishing industry and obviously... Uh, certainly East Nuke in Scotland is very famous for like, fishing ships and having this, uh, the sort of fisheries around there. That's their sort of main business, essentially. You know, they rely on the fishing industry, you know, and the local wares and stuff that come from that area. And it's something that goes from sort of, it goes throughout the sort of family. So if you're in a fishing family, you're more likely forever going to be in the fishing family. And, you know, you might save up, get your own fishing boats, or you might just work in the different industry there, which is really cool. So that's the sort of the main gist of it in a nutshell. That is Salt Marsh. But then you look a little bit deeper into the history. So, and this is where I'm just going to do a very potted history from what I got in the first five pages. Because <laughs> there's obviously, I think, again, it's interesting about Wizards is that it's very dense, the first couple of pages, as yeah. both me and Sam were talking beforehand. Yeah. It's very hard to wrap your head around if you're not used to that sort of thing. But as soon as you've got the building blocks, it really helps the rest of the stuff come together. These are sort of the big themes and then the details come later. So essentially, 
in Kyolan, it's known for its military power. Its aim is to be sort of more aggressive with its expansion, so it's been fighting wars in the north and east and south to sort of make it sort of a, a known for its sort of fighting ability. So it's kind of left the southern coasts alone for the time being. It's sort of been neglected somewhat. And as a result, there has been sort of the rise of something called the Sea Princes, which is this uh, piracy federation, which in my head feels very much like Pirates of the Caribbean, like <laughs> that you've got um, Captain Barbosa and you've got, um, oh, the squid one, which I can never remember the name of. But Davy Jones. Mind. There you go, Davy Jones. So you've got all that sort of like going on. I like to think that they're just, they're just not even like their own islands with it. It's just ships roped together. Yes, <laughs> yes. And they have meetings and parlays and anyway. So you have the sea princes, which has le led to the rise of things, you know, smuggling and slavery. And what's interesting in Salt Marsh is that it says quite early on, it says smuggling is seen as a victimless crime. So it's okay. And obviously it brings money in <laughs> and you might pay a bit more than fishing. So like that's okay. Slavery, on the other hand, ooh, no, they're, they are not a fan of that. So you have this sort of, this history of, certainly the, the traditionalists, which we'll go on to, they remember the times when the sea princes were at the highest of powers. They remember that, you know, the slavery and the violence that these pirates had so sort of brought to the local fishing villages. So they're, they're not keen to have that again, but also they remember how the crown neglected them in this time of desperation and need. Eventually, the king, whose name is a great name, it's Kimber Toss Scotty. I think that's his name. I know. D&D yeah. has some great names where you think they must have had a dartboard with uh, with little notes on. Um, Just ram their head against the keyboard and hope for the best. <laughs> like, that will do. Um, <laughs> they notice eventually that there's this, this federation of piracy going on. And as a result, they've been sort of battling like a, a force of wills, trying to reestablish authority. The Crown is cracking down on sort of smuggling and piracy in general and going away from their agenda of military tradition and focusing one more on trading. And so now the Crown has sent down several sort of delegates into places like Salt Marsh to sort of re-establish their presence and sort of look towards making these sort of little villages into a commercial hotspot. And one big example of this, which is talked about in the book, is a place called Seaton which is just down the road, essentially. But it's used to, it basically, it's twice as big as salt marshes. But over sort of a couple of months, it was turned into this basically horrific trading hub. And it's all, it's described as drab, it's full of like sh shipping vessels and just horrible. And as a result, sort of the, the traditionalists are, don't want salt marsh to turn into this. They want to keep it back mm. to their old ways. They want to, they do want to have the fishing, but at their level, they want that, they feel that if expanding it anymore would mean they would lose stuff like the smuggling and not be able to gain that as that much money. On the other hand, on the side of it, so that's just the traditionalists want the ways to be as it was before with minus the sea prince's sort of influence. They want to focus on fishing and that's it. And then on the other hand, on sort of the other flip side of the coin, you have the loyalists who are sort of come from the crown, sort of been given authority to come here and do certain things. So most of the town guard, for example, are, have been paid for by the crown to crack down on smuggling. And also, again, it's a little bit of a mention, but it's actually quite important to this, is there's been discovered that in the cliffs and the hills nearby to Salt Marsh, there is uh, precious metals. So they've sent in a sort of delegation of dwarves start a mining business and help that out with the crown as well and that's sort of the reason for them wanting to change salt marsh into a trading hub is that there's more things here that will be worth a lot more money possibly than tradition so those are the sort of two main factions you have the sort of fighting in a way over salt marsh but then oh but then sam have the secret the secret third one i know oh, i know is this is this spoilers uh, i don't know if it's spoilers but Not for DMs. No, exactly. So, spoilers if you're going to be a player in, in Salt Marsh. Stop so, listening, Stop players. listening now. <laughs> so, the Secret Third faction is a underground group called the Scarlet Brotherhood. Um, and this is where I forget off the top of my head where they come from. But essentially, they want to expand their own power for their own nation, which is not in Kyoland. And they want to basically weaken the crown, but also upset sea princes a little bit as well. And by doing so, they're just going to try and make them fight over each other. 
and as a result, slowly but surely take out the traditionalists and the loyalists and then supplant them with their own sort of agents to bring about this power. So that happening underneath, you get this sort of really sort of, uh, what's the word? It's not, they're not even smugglers, they're just, it's like spies, essentially. They're, mm. They just happen to be undercover, waiting for their moment to shine. And essentially, there's a great uh, passage saying, oh yes, they are definitely the evil faction. Yeah. <laughs> There's no grey here. It's just, no, they're evil. Whereas the traditionalists and loyalists, obviously, you could just pick your side, perhaps, and maybe the players might want to do that, depending on what missions they get. But he goes, no, 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 no. You don't, don't do it. They're out for themselves. <laughs> the Scarlet Brotherhood, they're just going to cause chaos, so don't, don't even try it. <laughs> and they kind of see themselves as better than everyone else, isn't it? They mm -hmm. kind of see themselves as a higher race, despite not necessarily being of a race. So, yeah, they're... Yeah, that, that's it. Full on Nazis. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. Yeah, They're, so that's it. It's they they come from an ancient empire called the Sul Imperium, mm -hmm. which again you like you're going. Oh, someone someone's done a word generator there. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure this is all again. Forgotten Realms must have all of these somewhere, but. Their goal is to restore the old Solosian, or the old houses, <laughs> to prominence in this world. So it's, yeah, so it's interesting. And with this one as well, so let's go back quickly. So the council, uh, you have at least, at least, this is the thing I this we are going to come on to, there's at least two loyalists and two traditionalists. And then you have a neutral third one who thinks they are a traditionalist, someone called Amber Sold, Sold, Sold who is, a, is from a trading fishing family who's recently inherited it all because of a death in the family, the sort of matriarch, his mother. And aside this character is, in any, <laughs> in any film, you have the sort of helpful, loving sort of butler who is here to help you out. I think it's called uh, Stephen or something like that, or Stephen <laughs> with a K. Um, and he, it's interesting because one thing I will say, what I like about this chapter is that the main minor characters, so the people that are on the council, or the, the more notable characters, sorry, they are very fleshed out. You, mm. you know their personality traits, you know their bonds, you know stuff, and this guy is very interesting because he basically has two personalities. So you know if he's doing this, he's going to be a loving fatherly figure. He's like, you know, really wants to care for his safety. But then it says it just takes him a moment to focus and he turns into a cold-blooded killer. And you're like, Ooh. And it says he's a man of patience. And it gives a story about how he waited in an attic for three days to assassinate someone by dropping a, a little bit of acid or whatever through a, a crack in the floorboard onto the person's head, and then waited another day for him to die. And you're like, damn, this, this guy. <laughs> Where the fury of a patient man. Ooh, I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> Those are sort of the big main themes to consider. And I quite like that because certainly for me, when I'm starting out on an adventure, again, I use the story so that, oh, the characters are in this, doing this story and the town is an element of it. But actually, if you start about what well, the town is the campaign and you have all these elements and then your players interact with it, suddenly they are caught up in something that's so much bigger than themselves. And sometimes it's some, certainly I, I don't know about you, Sam, but sometimes when we play our campaign, I feel there's so much going on that I don't know if anything I do is right. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's sometimes hard to give players that visibility of politics, really, because unless they're wheeler dealing or spying on people specifically, it's hard to show them that aspect of what's going on in the background. But it's nice nice to feel that there is something going on there that you don't quite have a grasp on. What about you? What stood out for you in this very long chapter of Saltmarsh? Was there anything that you were like, that's really cool, or oh, I really like this? That very dense first section that you've just gone through, the kind of the politics element. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say, that side of d and I find really tricky mm -hmm. to get into. I find it really, as you said, the word dense is perfect, and I find it really hard as a DM to engage players and that kind of stuff, just because mm. all my players, I've got about a dozen now, when I'm DMing to them, they're always tired. <laughs> and when you're tired, you want to kill monsters. You don't want to know that Gurgle Thurg is unhappy with Burgle Thurg because they don't want the mining company to come in and with the dwarf taking our gerbs. 
but, but I can see it being really nice for the DM to know this stuff is going on in order to keep the world consistent. Because mm. the players may not consciously spot this thing's happening on, but as a DM, it really helps keeping you on the straight and narrow in terms of a, a world. Mm, definitely. It feels almost like a video game in a way. So, like, I say this to someone who's only played, like, maybe the first couple of hours of it, but I don't know if you've ever played um, Dragon Age at all, Sam, or, or know of it, where, obviously, again, it's that sort of thing where you, obviously, you pick your, your character or whatever, and they've got different backgrounds, and then what you... And then right at the beginning, you obviously, you, you hate some people, but you like some other people. But then you meet companions along the way. And certainly very early on, uh, and this is where I'm going to be really bad, is if you want to explain things badly, I think that's a new section I need to put into the podcast. <laughs> you come to a village, and there is a future companion locked in a cage who's like, I will be here if you need me. And you're like, oh, I need to get that person out. That's fine. And then... I was stupidly like, I'm just going to go away. And I'd heard that there was rumours of an attack coming. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. And obviously I come back from completing a, a really important mission. It's clearly one of those story missions where he goes, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, he's not going anywhere. The whole town was decimated. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result, I couldn't unlock that character because they had died. And I was like, oh, no. But I, I was going to, I, was, I had a conversation. I was going to free him. And that's here, again, as soon as a player picks something, instantly other avenues of opportunity are closed off. And it's very, I think that's very decisive as a player. I quite, I don't know about you, Sam, but if I do something wrong in a video game, I will restart back at the save point or go, you know, I, yes. I feel so bad. And I think that's just the sort of player I am. But like, this feels very decisive. You like, you've made this choice and you made it back in session two or three and now here are the consequences and it's like whoa that's that's I, it's it's a different style of story like you said i think sometimes people are like well D, i can be the hero i can do this but then i wonder if some players don't really want to know the full extent of their consequence the consequences you know like they want to do an action they're like well i'm the hero and everything is great now because i did a thing but actually i think the more interesting stories is when you've done something and it comes back and you're like, well, you did save the day, but you did, you didn't save that one person. And then their families are waiting. And it's, it's, it's a weird, I don't know, it's a weird sort of mechanic, I guess. I, I quite like doing, but I know in video games I don't like it, so I don't know if I, how much I enjoy it in doing a role-playing game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like giving players choice and not necessarily tricking them into things that... Like when when they make a choice to have something that has consequences, I like them to know those consequences. So if they do something and they're not aware of, oh, I'm doing this for so and so, but it might have this effect, I mm. feel that it can sometimes feel like a bit of a trick when you suddenly, oh, we've done something and this has affected this. Mm. I mean, so if you, so our fabulous DM Ryan, he put little breadcrumbs, little clues mm. in. Uh, campaign that we've been doing where we were doing something and we were there were there were senses of feelings that it wasn't quite right so when the payoff came out that we had completely ruined everything it <laughs> it, it didn't feel like we were completely it wasn't ryan pulling the wool over our eyes it was something we knew we were going towards and was kind of going to happen so i think there needs to be that from yes. the DM, and this book leaves it so open in mm. that regard. It's not like you side with these people, this happens, or you side with these people, this happens. It's very, these are the elements involved, use them as you will. Mm. And that, that's quite scary, actually. Yeah, no, I agree. It's, it's just some, I, I don't know, it feels like a lot of creative power, which is, as you sort of said, in a way, it's, it is kind of shared between the players and the DM. To sort of mold it a bit to what it is. But I agree, it's one of those things where the DM has so much knowledge in their heads. And if the players don't necessarily go talk to someone, you're like, it's all here. Go go speak to so and so. I have so much knowledge. I have so much to say. Um, yeah, we'll do the next mission. We'll just do the next mission. Like, God damn. Um, we want to find a monster. <laughs> well, exactly. For me, looking at the stuff, I. There's several things that I, I quite liked. 
so again, we've got those big themes at the top, which again is a different way of thinking, perhaps, of how you would sort of create, start to create your village. So if you were going to create a town or a village, you're like, okay, what are the main themes? Like, where is it situated? You know, where is it geographically? If it's inland, it's probably going to be more trading stuff. If it's by the sea, obviously fishing. In a forest, it might be harvesting or anything like that. So yeah, so I mentioned that I quite like that the sort of the minor major characters of the piece have quite fleshed out stories so that you could be, pick them up and, and be fully confident that these are the main points that they want to hit and that that's quite good. Sometimes you're like, oh, I'm not sure. But even people like Crag, the half-orc grave digger who's good with the books and likes research mm-hmm. and all he wants to do is like help organise this library with Elanda and, and he's like, if you help me with the cemetery and help dig the graves, you can come read the books. I'm like, oh, yeah, I want to I wanna go help out Greg. Uh, <laughs> and then you've got, I think, possibly the coolest sort of description of a, a minor character is, uh, well, I swear I'm going to say it wrong. Is it Welgar Brian Hander, the one legged former whaler turned priest of Procan? Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like a man with a career change. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I can just imagine like a proper uh, Captain Ahab sort of giving uh, sermons and be like, the sea! And everyone's going, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, Why are we eating seaweed? <laughs> These crisps are terrible. <laughs> My God, that's so true. They would have like a monopoly on seaweed-based food products. <laughs> but I think that's quite cool because, again, he's a, he's a character who you can mention and uh, sort of sprinkle him in the stories, but also he has quests. He's one of those sort of quest givers who goes, well, if you're going to go out to the sea, could you check these shipwrecks? So I want to bring sailors home to give them a proper burial, which it's, it's one of those things, again, I think, and this is where so the sort of the appearance of someone versus their intent. So obviously sometimes you're like, oh, I can't, like, oh, Captain John Silver, etc. And you're like, oh, no. And then this person's like, no, no, I... I genuinely want to put these people to rest. And I think it's, it's just managing expectations that not everyone who has an eye patch or, or it has, you know, a missing leg is definitely evil. Which, again, <laughs> I just, it's true. Like, any type of pirates you think of, like... I just keep getting, like, Pirates of Caribbean flashes and um, and the Rolling Stones guy. Uh, what's it called? Nick. Oh, no. no. Um... Keith. Keith. Oh, no. Oh, no. Our knowledge. You're the music person. <laughs> yeah, but I don't listen to the Rolling Stones. Keith Richards. Keith Richards be- being uh, being Jack Sparrow's dad. I also quite liked the the Doc rumor table. I, I missed I, that. The book has some great tables, like random. That chapter has some great like random tables in it. And and that's what I quite like. Is that I think sometimes you you should really stuck for inspiration, right? As a as a DM, you're like, I need to do something in this session. What could it be? And they've got stuff for like the doc rumors. Or you go around and you hear a rumor, and it will probably lead to nothing. But it's just quite cool because you can have that quick RP interaction, and you go, "What? You talk of the sea? Well, le- let me tell you, somebody's sabotaging fishing boats. It's them dwarves." And you're like, "Okay, <laughs> like move on." But, they um, took our jobs. They took our jobs. There's ones about ghosts. There's ones uh, about. The dwarves, they, they're trying to do something, you're not sure. Um, there's traders posing as, as elves, but they're not elves. All that sort of thing. So again, that's sort of like, it's. I think it says like, the docks are a hotbed for rumours and gossip. I'm like, ooh, yes. <laughs> I want to have I love the, um, the table on the mood of the dock. Yeah. Well, do you want to explain what that is, Sam? Oh, well, um, so you roll like the random table and that decides how successful the kind of the the town has been in their fishing ventures or in their smuggling ventures for that week or whatever and depending on that the kind of the townspeople may be more receptive to you or more friendly with you or more parties or they can be like surly and you can see people really struggling to get by Mm -hmm. and i think that's cracking having this world which is so dynamic and that's not necessarily because the players have had an impact they just happen to turn up on a bad day and that's yeah. quite cool, because then they're probably like, wait, something's wrong with this town. And it's like, yeah, because they're, they're miserable. <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> yeah. it's not about you. <laughs> I also thought the three taverns that are mentioned are great, great nautical names. So you've got the snapping line, the empty net, and then randomly, the wicker goat. <laughs> the wicker goat. 
<laughs> yes, and obviously, in a certain locale or certain groups of people will uh, will frequent something. So the snapping line, I think, would be considered uh, local, essentially. So you've got the fishers, the sailors, and the labourers. So obviously, if you turn up there as an adventurer, it might be a bit awkward. <laughs> um, you've got the empty net, which is definitely the more seedy ones, smugglers and the criminals. And then the wicker goats is the dwarves and the town guards. So you've got each of these sort of individual sort of loyalist sea princes a little bit with the empty net and then the um, traditionalists with the sacking line. And again, they're all sort of got their, they've got tavern owners, they've got his, his spaces. And here's where I think it's like the leader of the dwarves, uh, the copper locks, will frequent this if she's not in the mine. Or so again, there's so much detail in it. And there is so much detail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think there's, there's one paragraph where it goes on about and the guard for the outskirts of the town will probably change around this time of day from yes. this type of guard to this type of guard. And this type of guard will have these kind of weapons and wear this kind of armor. And they'll probably go, and that level. I was thinking, you could just put, there's guards outside the town. <laughs> and this is something to point out, I think, because like we're sort of looking at here, there's for this sort of town, and it talks about also the town itself, it gives you geographical locations, it gives you key features, it gives you characters, it gives you the region itself and the history of the politics in all the 30 pages. This is to say you do not have to have this when creating your own town. You literally just maybe need a couple of things, and they're just ideas. Like Sam said, like, I can't imagine working out guard patrols unless I knew my parties were like, we're going to try and stop the guard. I'm like, all right, maybe I will have to do something very quickly. But yeah, like it's 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 quite a lot of detail, but this has taken, I think, years and years of work. And obviously this is like updated material from 3.5 as well. Obviously they had salt marsh back in previous ones. So they've just updated the detail and added a lot more to it. So I think it is overwhelming when you first read it because you're like, there's so much here. What if I forget it? It's okay to forget because you could just make up stuff. As long as you don't go, oh, I panic, and then say something that's silly, your players won't know. As long as you're sort of really sort of, you know, you stick to those sort of key points and sort of outlines, the details are something you can fill in later. Or, or your players will fill in, and that's fun when you get a player to fill in something. And there's um, one of the downtime activities, which is some explored in Xanathar's, which I've actually not really looked at that much, it talks about making contacts in Salt Marsh. So you could spend some time carousing, drinking at these places and what you're willing to spend. And, stuff, and then you can make a contact. Now, whether it's one that the DM creates or you could give it over to, to the players. Now, you could describe them, you know, where, and it just more depends on where have you met them. So those three sort of taverns we talked about, if you were in the staffing line, you probably met a fisherman local and they probably are related to these sort of traditionalists as so you might be able to get audiences with them or you might be able to hear more about the stuff that's going on there. Whereas, obviously, if you're in, like, the Wicked Goats, you're probably going to be more buddy-buddy with the town guards and maybe find out a bit more about the Crown's agenda and stuff like that. But the players can come up with whatever name, if it's, like, Ted the Guard, and then they've built this person, and it's sort of like, oh, well, Ted the Guard's going off on patrol. What? No, we must protect him! <laughs> you know, it adds that sort of collaborative element, which I quite like. One of the downtime activities was helping to organise the library, yes. as you mentioned previously, and... It wasn't until you kind of, you said, oh, yeah, that'd be nice to help these people. I was like, who in their right mind would want to help <laughs> organise a library? Me? <laughs> it sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do a couple of the quick sort of key locations which, again, sort of stand out to me as the person who would be running a game about, oh, these would be really cool to explore further. So one of the earlier sort of locations is one called the Dwarven Anvil, which is like a blacksmith. And what's key to note about it is that it's run by humans who are very, very skilled at what they do. But the dwarves in the mind things are like, something's not right. That's Dwarven insignia over the, over the, the thing. It's called the Dwarven Anvil. Something's not right. And they may ask the adventurers to go in, break in essentially, and steal stuff so that they could sort of check it out. But the description doesn't say like, oh yes, those people are clearly evil. It just gives you, it's like, oh, it's kind of up to you. You know, are you going to say, oh yes, we inherited my husband's a dwarf or something like that, or, and he passed away or etc. And I just thought, that's quite nice. Like a, a weird sort of thing where they're like, we want you to do a possibly illegal thing, but it's very important to us. So I quite like that <laughs> as, a, as a sort of interesting like, feature in the town. 
adding more tension to the politics that are going on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then another side one was the Shark Fin Bridge, which again is this bridge that leads over to the main area of Salt Marsh, and as you sort of going into town, and it's a big bridge with houses on it that sort of build up and shops and stuff like that, and you've got two carriages going around. So it's again very visually, it's quite cool very sort of like i can imagine like an impact fishing village with lots of things people shouting stuff like that but it has a weird sort of like knack whereas anyone with fey ancestry feels a bit sick when they cross it because there's some sort of curse on the bridge but again it doesn't it doesn't say why but you could just be like you know you could just do it to any of your fey they're like something's wrong in salt marsh and you're like well there's always something wrong in salt marsh that's just the bridge you know uh, but like it's almost like um almost like a red herring in a way i guess like just having little things like that just to flavor which again you can use in your campaigns or not i mean you could totally forget about this bridges like little quirk and then later on you go oh shit you've been feeling sick this whole time <laughs> but i will say my favorite favorite location well actually no sam do you think you can guess in salt marsh what do you think my favorite thing in the town is Ooh. or favorite location that's been put in the town to be honest, the mm-hmm. ones that really drew my eye were outside of the city. Oh, well, we'll get to those. Yeah, so uh, let me guess. Uh, lighthouse. Oh, no, not that. Creepy, uh, creepy old man in the house where no one usually comes to visit. No, not not not, uh, not the wizard, no. One more guess. Um, there wasn't a pet shop, was there? Oh, well, it's, <laughs> it's close, but no cigar. It's is it the Crabber's Cove, which is a lot of abandoned housing. But, you know, for various... It doesn't really say why, but it's just full of crabs. <laughs> like, they've taken over. <laughs> but there's no... There's, again, it doesn't really say anything about, like, oh, there's a giant crab living there. There is actually a little, again, a little throwaway detail saying that, by the way, there's a vampire that's trapped there. Uh, it can't leave. But it's heard all about the Secret Brotherhood and is willing to give that information for its freedom. I think it's cursed that only someone pure of heart could carry him from this place. So, again, that's why I'm sort of like... What? What? Yeah. What but are we again, supposed to do with that? Exactly. <laughs> but I just love the idea that there's just like, um, it's based off the birds of the film, but you know that episode in The Simpsons where Maggie's placed into like a, a baby care thing and they go and pick her up and they're surrounded by little babies with, with suckers and they're just watching them pick up Maggie and leave. That's mm. what I think when I see these crabs. They're also there, they're still clicking and then they all look at you. And they just don't, they don't do anything. They just, just sort of wait, and then they move out of the way as you move. That would be good. I love crabs. Oh. <laughs> crabs. Well, let's talk about your favourite things, Sam, outside of Salt Marsh. What are, what are the key yeah. things that you, you were like, these are cool? As chapter one kind of goes on, it kind of expands. And I quite like how they've done this. So they, they look first at Salt Marsh, this little backwater town on the brink of change. And then... Once you're kind of familiar with that huge history dump in your face, mm. it then goes on to what's kind of outside it. And there's there's kind of fortresses by kind of underwater civilizations. Mm-hmm. There's kind of roads leaving off the mines, things like this. But the ones that really drew me in, they had like three different locations, which were like marshy forests mm-hmm. or kind of abyssal forests and things mm. like that. And there was plenty in those chapters with regards to kind of plot hooks and things that you can really, it's comfort food. You can yeah. get your teeth into it. You know, there's a um, there's a witch there called Granny Nightshade oh. with her army of minions. And when you enter the forest, you're drawn towards her <laughs> and things like that. Oh, and there's one part, there's a forest called the Drowned Forest. Yeah. It's called the Drowned Forest or something like that. And it's kind of half abyssal, kind of bits of other dark planes kind of seeped into it. Mm-hmm. And there's a table, which is Oddity's table. Yes, yes. And it's just full of stuff which, it's not an encounter. Like the crabs, it's something that's weird, but not necessarily meaningful. Mm. And I love adding those little things. So there's there's one where you, you find a legless zombie that's been mm. tied up. And there's loads of other zombies around it dead and with an investigation check you can figure out someone's using these as shooting practice he ties them up or she ties them up and then and um boats stuck in trees in the middle of a marsh that's such a great image oh yeah and the tree leaves kind of 
floating like yeah. the sea. Oh, love it. I particularly liked the, maybe the slightly creepier side of it, the sort of the 20 foot diameter huts made from animal bones and dry branches with the floor covered in humanoid teeth. I was like, I'm just gonna put that there. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry about it. But yeah, like I, I just the image that like you said of the of a, a full ship just in a tree, and it's like, how did that get there? Again, these sort of unexplained mysteries, which you can leave, and you might not even have any rumors about it. It's a bit like I was uh, going off on a thread here, but um, I don't know if you've ever heard of staircases in the forest on Reddit. Again, it's one of those ones where it's like creepy pasta s type thing. And again, it's one of the things where you're not sure if it's true, if it is true, but they're like, oh, I used to be a park ranger. And here are some weird things that happened, you know, where you'd find people's bodies up like a 20 foot tree, but you don't know how they got there, etc. But then this person's talked about stairs in the forest. So that you would you would just be walking along in the forest, you know, keeping guard or, or, or patrolling to make sure things are safe, and you get to a clearing and there'd just be a staircase in the forest. And it could look like any kind of staircase. It could look like a modern 21st century sort of like spiral staircase with no uh, banister. It could look like an old fashioned 1920s staircase just going up, big or small. And you would see that there looks like to be an end. But then you're told as part ranger, if you see them, just ignore them. And whatever you do, do not go on them and do not go up one. Mm-hmm. And that was the story. And you're like, whoa, I like that. There's just a little bit of like, just, just ignore the ship in the tree. Why? Oh, maybe there's something other. No, just don't ask. And I think that's much creepier and much. I mean, there'll be some people in the party like, no, I'm going to go up there, and you could just you could just enhance the um, the weirdness of the forest. So, like he was saying, like Granny Nightshade, there is this um, ability that this forest has where if they roll a uh, a save or something at the end of a long rest, they sleep in the forest, and they roll a one. The forest marks them. Which again is like, whoa. And anything they fight the next day knows their name, knows what they're doing, and has advantages oh, against them so during good. the fight. And and will so say to good. them, say to them, join us, join Granny Nightshade. You're like, whoa, that's oh, I love it. I love it, I love it, I love it. There's like mm-mm, tasty, tasty. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of nice little touches like that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So obviously you've got your town, you've got all the different themes, you've got all the sort of locations and a bit of the region stuff as well. I know we've only briefly touched on them. But the other thing, right at the end of this chapter, are two things actually. So there's if you've got already preset adventures, so from the Tales of the Yawning Portal, or you've got the Salt Marsh has obviously quite a few of the updated modules as well, like and gives you advice on how to sort of uh, tweak them or put them in, which is actually quite nice. So like uh, mm. Tomb of Horrors, you can put it into the Drowned Forest if you like. Uh, the Sun of the Citadel, which I've certainly run a few times, it's uh, one of the earliest ones I ran, that could be in the Deadwood. Again, just something a little bit different so that people can travel there and be it's still a part of the, the region, which I thought was quite nice. But then, I thought this was quite cool. So some of the other pre-written modules, like Curse of Strahd, sometimes have specialist backgrounds to sort of really get a, a character, if you created a character specifically for this campaign, to really put them together. So in, the, in Curse of Strahd, it's the Haunted One, is their background. In this one, it's not only added some backgrounds, uh, but it's also tweaked or given ideas that you can do for the backgrounds you've got already, which I thought was quite nice, actually, because if you're, like, setting it away from the Forgotten Realms, but definitely having a seafaring or swamp-like thing, some of the stuff, you might be struggling for, like, ideas and stuff, and some of these backgrounds also tie your story in more closely with the council members and other major people in the town, which I thought was quite good. So the, the three new ones, and I'm sure Sam, you'll correct me if I'm wrong about, uh, if I've missed one, but there's like the fishermen, or oh, sorry, fishers, sorry. They have a, another great table, which I absolutely love, is yeah. called the fishing tale. Oh, so good. I, oh, so uh, I'll quickly, I will badly explain, but I just love, basically you can roll for a compelling tale, whether it's tall or true, to entertain and impress others. It was and this big. Exactly, and this is why I'm like, this would make for an interesting character, because instantly people telling tales are like, well, it was a dark, stormy night, and I'm telling you, it got away, you know, and again, it's just like, oh god, Hest is talking about fishing again. Yeah. But like, yeah, the ghost fish, which you mentioned earlier, yeah, you're haunted by a ghostly fish only you can see. How good is that? Oh, it's so good. <laughs> it's like it's the kind of thing where the other players would have to roll to stay awake. Yes. 
oh yeah you, they do that or even every so often you know, the player's like is it still here and you're like oh yeah it's just in the corner looking at you <laughs> I quite liked lobster wrestling as well as another one. You fought hand to hand combat with uh, immense lobster. <laughs> like, I just, it's just a little that'd be, bit. That'd be especially good if you're a halfling. Exactly. And that, that's what I quite like is that you, you can properly twist these to be tall tales or true. That's why I would want to do something. Like, you could just, you could obviously make up your own. But, and the so. Nemesis Clan. The Nemesis Clan, so a large oh. clan containing a pearl the size of your head claimed one of your fingers before jetting away. One day you'll find that clan. <laughs> I will get my finger back. Look, look at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I just I just thought that was quite fun. And then on the flip side, so that's more, I would assume that's more of the comedic side of things. Oh, I love it, yeah. Fisher. And then you've got the Marine, who has a table called Hardship Endured. Which is like you. Uh, there's like obviously it's like your. I guess not edge lord backstory, but something that you're like. I nearly drowned. <laughs> I, I almost, I almost did this, and it controlled my life. You know, captured. It's not juggernaut. I quite like. Uh, no reasonable explanation can explain how you survived a particular battle. Every arrow and bolt missed you. You slew scores of enemies single-handedly and led your comrades to victory. I am the night. I am the night. I was born in the dark. I was born in the dark. dark. <laughs> you fancy some Jimmy Tangers. <laughs> I think as well. Oh, I don't. I don't know if it's him, but something I was reading recently in improv, talking about how you can say so much with so few words. So there's a game in improv where you can only limit yourself to three words, and they have to be full sentences. So you can't just be like, but imagine if you're playing the Marine and you'd be like, where are they? We'll go now. That sort of thing. You have to think about it. Yeah. But you could make so many cool statements and be a man of few words or a woman of few words, sorry. And I think that would just really change the role play aspect of it. You being a gruff person and then you constantly having to work out how many, how many words you say. And they'd be like, good. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Onward. Onward. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a proper Witcher style kind of character, essentially. And then the final one, which I, I quite like as well, is the shipwright, where obviously you've got a feature which is that I can patch that, and you can patch a ship quite easily. You've got form repairs on the water vehicle, which would be quite good if your campaign's mostly at sea. And life at sea, again, giving you that sort of bit of an origin story. Uh, how, again, a bit, it could be a bit of a tall tale, so like, solid and sound you patched up a war galley and prevented it from sinking the local navy regards you as a friend imagine it like a halfling or a gnome using that to like all right jeff and they're like oh. <laughs> it's like oh no do you know that guy no <laughs> so, uh, do you, uh, how's she doing how how's the the like um the intrepid uh, reckoning doing like <laughs> it sank <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so I, I quite like the idea that you could yeah all and there's obviously so many more in the Salt Marsh book, but those are the three sort of new ones I saw were adding to it. With all these ideas and the kind of concepts it we, it gives you, we talked about how it's so flexible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just there's so much you can just grab out and copy paste. Is there like a specific way that you would implement some of the stuff in this if you were to run a campaign? Actually thinking about it, I think I would try to sort of have more in terms of politics involved, which I know we talked about a bit at the beginning about like, oh, getting your players and will they get it? But I think actually, when you think about it, politics does infiltrate quite a lot of our lives, whether we think it does or doesn't. And there's been a lot of talk recently about like, well, keep politics out of my D&D &D game and stuff. But actually, all these issues can actually make them a richer sort of uh, story. And certainly... As again, this is this comes with the caveat of if you talk to your players beforehand and say, hey, so we're going to, in this campaign, there is going to be an issue of slavery. And, you know, it's here's the history behind it in this campaign. First of all, does anyone feel uncomfortable exploring that issue uh, or facing it? I'm going to leave it up to you what you do with it, but just as long as everyone's on the same page and then keep checking in with that. So I think it's one of those things where it's an issue... Is rife in the world, and you will know about it. It won't be a massive shock to you 
if you hear about it or if you you hear tales or if you come across a ship with slaves on it and i think it's just maybe that's plus the politics of, about having and even if it's just petty politics it doesn't have to be mm. big oh we're going to war against the crown it could be little things like over planning permissions for a new dock i think yeah. that's what <laughs> that's what i would do maybe have an argument over the fishes market and well well, they ordered so many stalls, but there's not enough space. So one of you <laughs> has to talk it out. That's what I want. That's what I want. A whole council meeting about pettiness. That's what I want. And then and then seeing if anything comes from that. I don't think this is where I think I probably probably wouldn't use the Scarlet Brotherhood that much unless they get a really lucky roll and you go, you know what? I'm going to turn this on its head. Um, mm. But yeah, I would probably involve the politics a little bit more and look at like the everyday. So local government dealing with all these issues and then coming down and then like like it says like there are they have personal agendas they have discussions and, and talks and stuff but they will have their own priorities and what they want to protect and stuff so if you could add a few more like like selfish trivial things that would be quite interesting like um the the person gellan prime water which again is another fantastic minor character name he's evil because he likes smuggling and it's done a lot for his business. So he's, even though he's a traditionalist, he's a bad person, really. He's trying to be like, you know, support the other person who is, um, yo, yo, something. Uh, this How do you remember all these days? It's because I wrote a lot of notes. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and like, so using that as a prop, like pushing, like agreeing with her agenda, but actually it's to get suspicion away from his stuff. And I'm like, that's, mm. I quite like that. Being a selfish NPC or a minor character that's not like, ha-ha, I am going to take over this town, I'm going to be evil. It's just someone who's greedy. So maybe that as well, having greedier minor characters who are just making the use of the system. What about you, Sam? Have you had any thoughts? Like, well, you have used Salt Marsh in other things. I know you did, obviously, did our one shot. Not necessarily using Salt Marsh, per se, but is there anything you would you would implement, possibly, in, in your campaigns, or if you had implemented anything? Yeah, well, as you say, I've implemented bits from later in the book quite a bit. But chapter one, a lot of it is quite specific to that setting. But there is stuff, as you say, that you could kind of lift and move. The thing that I would probably feel would be good to get players involved in the politics is to give something that invests the players in that location, be it like they own a fishery business or like a, a shop or something, something that maybe one of the players inherited. Yeah. Then they feel they have a say. Maybe one of them could be like one of the minor lords of the area, someone who has a say in that council, and they even has the swaying vote. Yes. And I think that that would really push that forwards, perhaps, mm. especially if there's a conflict of interest of their own goals versus maybe being good people. Yeah, I like that idea of, yeah, like if you are like a, from a, a fisher background, you have a trading, you know, a medium-sized one, but you have sway in the council in some way. That could be really interesting. I think that was some of the things I wasn't particularly keen on, actually. Was it just, I think I believe, and that's where you probably correct me if I'm wrong, there's only like five council members. You've got uh, the two traditionalists. This is, a, uh, this is where the yeah, next one is. It's like revising for a history exam. Sorry, I'm sorry. First. Reading those first four pages, it's just like, oh, Bob, Bob but again, doesn't but this, like Jeff. But... <laughs> but this is, but this, and then this comes into the thing, what you were saying, though. It's like, there's so much in your head, but actually, like, once you've read it once, you can interchange the names of something else. Uh, like, yeah. So you've got Ida Oland, who is the current senior council member, so I presume she has, like, is the main one for the towns, supported by Gellan Primewater, and then Anders Solman, who's like sort of like is part of the town but is secretly being influenced by Scarlet Brotherhood. You got those three, and then you've got uh, Ilanda, who's the, the sort of town guard person, and then Manstred Cockerlox, which again, <laughs> so uh, good. great name, and she is uh, the leader of the dwarves uh, at the mine. So you have five, and it makes sense to have an odd number so that they'll always have a vote. But I just feel like you could have so many other minor. Or maybe like you have two because obviously they're elected as well. But like you could have like other people who maybe have influence or have shops, have uh, say over other things. Like maybe give Crag the gravedigger an actual job. <laughs> like, 
but yeah, I think I think that's the thing because like the council obviously has a lot of power, and there's very little about the process really about what they obviously they do the day to day stuff. I assume and they have the meetings, but there's not. I get. I guess it's because you don't expect your players to sit in on it. But do they have like you know how they do with the the House of Commons or, or used to? Sorry, um, where you could go in and watch them have the the debate and have the conversation or have a town meeting, and you have like the local fishermen. Like, I I the ghost fish are attacking. Oh god, not this guy. You know, like you have to listen. It's a bit like um I, I, actually leading on from that. I would say a really good recommendation for something like that if you're going to put like a town meeting and stuff. Parks and recreation where yes. Amy, Amy Poulter's character has to sit in for town meetings about parks, and there's people just complaining about all sorts of crap, which is great. <laughs> yeah, just getting Ron Swanson in as well to deal with annoying people. That, and that would be a really cool characteristic, just to, just to play those different types of things. Another good thing that I, I think would be nice to include is that there's like a, a huge amount of coastal folklore from you know Europe and America and stuff. Um, I grew up in Norfolk, where the most famous one, uh, which is shared with a lot of European countries, actually, is the tale of the black dog. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I think there's similar myths also inspired the Sherlock Holmes, Hound of Baskervilles, similar kind of dog, but along the Norfolk coast, which is called Black Shuck. And he used to kind of just stroll the beaches and, like, eat like wayward people who haven't moved back into the city quick enough when the night comes. But stuff like that would be great because yeah. just reading through some of the European folklore of coastal towns is, oh, it's a gold mine. Yeah. So do more of that stuff would be grand. Yeah, but more folklore into, into stuff, whether it's European or... Yeah, coastal stuff would be quite cool. Like, um, I know we've got, in Scotland, you have Kelpies. Uh, or was it Ireland? Or oh, this is a bad one, I don't remember. But I, those are the Kelpies. people who use. I, now, this is where I'm going to... Oh, it's Silkies. It's Kelpies and Silkies. Um, basically, they're the women that turn into seals. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, no, I've probably got this wrong now. <laughs> this is where Sam does a Google and it's like... No, no, these no, are yeah, so, so Silky. Silky, uh, okay, Silky. Yeah. I think wow. Kelpies are an actual fish. <laughs> no, I, I did see... No, well, that's a, a new one for me. <laughs> no, see also Kelpie uh, is a shape-shifting water spirit. Sorry, I, get, yeah. I, get very, I got very excited because I actually actually said something that was relevant and didn't. Yeah, have, yeah, yeah. I wasn't one hundred percent confident behind it. <laughs> I have to say, I'm more fond of selkies, half women, half seals. Yeah. Oh yeah, you have a lot more fun with them. Those gals know how to have a good time. <laughs> they, they know how to clap. <laughs> but which end is the seal? No. Right. <laughs> um. <laughs> is there anything in media of a similar vein that you would say is a good way of getting inspiration? I mean, coastal coastal towns, you know, it's very Cthulhu, so there's mm. elements there, but anything else that strikes your mind? Hmm. So, yes, yeah, so we mentioned a little bit like town meetings and politics. So I think politics-wise best thing I've seen on TV that actually got me interested in sort of like politics and fantasy settings would be Game of Thrones. I know everyone's like, I'm not sure about the ending and, so, and but the fact you have all these forces uh, from very far away impacting on smaller people and whilst I will say the TV show obviously is looking at those forces directly and not necessarily like the small villages or anything like that it's just a good idea of how those things are working. The other thing I would love to see, like I've already mentioned Pirates of the Caribbean, I think because it's not really mentioned that much in this particular chapter, I will say, I've not read the rest of the book, but the actual sea princes, I want to see more of that influence somewhere, so it's like a, almost like a hidden, unlocked thing, a secret achievement, perhaps. So obviously you've got the empty net as sort of a old smuggler, so it's related to them, possibly, but actually having someone who is, again, a bit like um, Skirin, sorry, his name's Skirin, actually, the Scarlet Brotherhood assassin slash butler, I'd like to see someone else who is also, like, maybe, like, sort of, so as a neutral party, but actually is an informant for the sea princes in some way. Or... There is, um, in the Azure Sea Random Encounters, there's mm. four pirate ships that you can randomly yes. encounter mm. uh, with with some characters with similarly amazing names like Therax Gordia. He has a pirate ship called the Nasher, which is uh, crewed by dragonborns and hobgoblins goblins and kobolds and mm. ogres and then there's the pale prow 
crewed by vampire swarm. But so yeah. you could make something up with them and bring them to the shore, I guess. That is true. I'd forgotten about the, the pale prowl. Uh, yeah, but again, another quick sort of paragraph or two, which talks about these sort of the vampire spawn with this ship. Again, a bit like Curse of the Black Pearl. They are searching for this elf's, uh, this uh, elf vampire's like long lost love where looking for a pearl with the blood drops of his true love which he's been looking for for centuries and he's i just think it's going to be if you get on that ship it is flamboyant as hell and you're like darling oh you should understand this pearl it has my true love <laughs> maybe it's like um what we do in the shadows but on the sea you know that's sort of the new oh. zealand pirates uh with, with vampiric uh, features oh that'd be quite cool i'd quite like that yeah can we have that <laughs> yes yes the other film that it, it reminded me of was kind of stupidly it it made me think of local hero have oh, you I ever seen that no oh, that it's, it's from 1983 and it's it stars lewis capaldi oh. looking gorgeous and young Oh, wait, do you, mean, do you mean Peter Capaldi, not Lewis Capaldi? Have I got it wrong? Because Peter Capaldi is the actor, Lewis Capaldi is the singer. I do mean Peter Capaldi. <laughs> hey, Lewis Capaldi's all right. I don't, I are think they, are they related? They are related. Father and son? Uh, I think it's like uncle and nephew, I think. Anyway, he's in well, it you know. and looking, looking very young. Mm. And it's about an American oil company sending... Um, a man to Scotland to buy up an entire village where they want to build a refinery. And ah. so you have the local town politics, which are essentially, do we sell up and essentially ruin our kind of yeah. lovely peaceful fishing village or, or do we kick them out? And the, the salesmen kind of get there and then fall in love with the place, but still go through with it. And it's, it's again, that whole thing of the big money, the crown coming in, to uh, disrupt the traditionalists and change things around. And there's like um, a love story that goes throughout it and things. And it's it's such a good movie, Fiona. You, it would be so up your street. You have oh, to watch it if you see I'm, it. On I'm going to put that on the, on the list then. That, yeah, exactly that. That idea of like, we're coming in and we're going to change things, but then falling in love with like, oh, how wonderful the town is. Everyone's lovely. And oh, don't turn us into the big uh, soulless trading hub. Absolutely. Mm. I think we have both thoroughly covered chapter one of Salt Much, and there's actually a lot to talk about, <laughs> considering how dense it is. There is a lot there. There's a lot of um, plot hooks. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of to kind of kick you off and start you on other stuff that caught is dense. Mm -hmm. It's definitely recommended to have a look through, but again, I think we've all been saying like, it can be overwhelming, and that's totally fine, so... So Sam, is there anything you'd like to plug? Anything that you're like, this is really cool, or if you want to find me on the internet, you don't have to say that, but you can do, you know, anything you think, oh, this will be good. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very sheltered life. It's work and talking to you guys. <laughs> Sam. <laughs> um, no, the, I guess I've been playing a, a game called Outer Wilds, which is quite interesting, mm -hmm. where you it's one of these games where you don't get told what to do, and you just explore. And I think that's that's good inspiration for D&D &D as well. So it's oh. free on Xbox at the moment. Have a look if you like. I am not sponsored by them, but Microsoft, if you're listening. <laughs> Please pay for my, my Game Pass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so I am Fiona, I forgot my name there for a second. I think I'm, it's is it McGuffin? McGuffin. Fiona McGuffin. Right, yeah, sure. My name is Fiona McGuffin, and I run the What Am I Running podcast. It's very twice, hot. it's very hot. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually sweating while talking to you. I know. Um, it's a twice monthly RPG one shot podcast. As I always say, it's, it's doing very, very well. It's brilliant. So well, smooth, so smooth. I, so, I was, the heat. Why did we decide to record on the hottest day of the year? I don't know. This is I blame you. I blame me. Right. Well, I'm I'm off to get a cold drink. So yeah, speak to you next time. Hold the bath for the beer. Bye guys. Bye. <laughs>